Uh, yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. 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 Right. So, uh, so that's that's it's a very fair question. So, how many people here have ever heard the phrase asymmetric information? Okay, so you know, about two thirds, I guess. All right, so, yeah, so, so economists talk about, I mean, there's, there's, there's actually three cases, but you mentioned perfect information and asymmetric information. So, asymmetric information is a case where someone has much better information about what's going on than somebody else. And if you go to an economics textbook, you can get, you can get some, some details about this problem. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I mean here, here's a couple things. First of all, uh, you know, perfect information is definitely not necessary for contracts to be signed and to be worthwhile because how often in the real world do we have perfect information? Starts with N. Never. Okay, so we never have perfect information. Now, how in the real world do we handle these kinds of asymmetric information problems? Well, there are a number of solutions. One of them is reputation. One of them is reputation. So a firm may, may present itself as being a great firm that everybody can trust. However, if you go and Google them and find out that there's a bunch of disgruntled employees, then that is a simple way of finding out, hey, uh, they may say that they're really wonderful. However, in, in, in actual practice, they're not. Of course, the normal case, what do, you do? What, what do you normally do if you find out that your employer is, a, is an incredible jerk and he did not tell you this when he hired you? you know, sometimes an employer will say, I'm an incredible jerk, and if you want to work for me, you've got to be able to deal with that. But most employers will not say that. Uh, what do you generally do if it turns out your employer is horrifying? You quit. Right? And it turns out that even in our current legal system, there's no law against being a jerk. Right? So far, we retain that freedom, the freedom to be a jerk. <laughs> so. Yes, and I know this, you know, my wife is a lawyer, so in the field of law, there are a number of, of well-known lawyers who are notorious for being the absolute biggest pigs on earth you can imagine. These are people who scream hysterically at you for anything and everything all day long. Okay, so these guys, basically, you know, most, most people work for them for a couple months, and they think, oh, I can handle this, and then they quit. Uh, and on the other hand, there's occasional, there's like, a, there's like a Wayland Smithers type character who will attach himself to such a lawyer and accept or even enjoy the abuse in exchange for a massive salary. Right? So in practice, the way that we normally solve this is, by, is with the, if you don't like it here, you can quit. And it is interesting that right now, for most things, bad things an employer can do to you, we still abide by this. We have this short list of exceptions where discrimination for the following th four reasons, for you know, race, age, you know, race, age sexual, sexual orientation, and gender. You, know, you can sue people for this, but if you are a white, a white straight male under the age of 40, and you want to sue your employer for, for treating you badly, it's almost impossible to do right now. And if there's an employer who just treats everyone like, like a dog, you know, you can say, look, I didn't discriminate. I yelled at him hysterically just like I do at everyone. That is actually a great defense in a court of law right now. <laughs> Amazingly enough, you say, look, I'm not, I'm not racist, I'm just evil. <laughs> Just evil to all. I, I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm the misanthrope. I hate all men and women. <laughs> right? That right now is, is legal. So the way we deal with that right now is if you don't like it, you can quit. Now, when you're talking about human rights violations, what if you sign a binding arbitration clause and the employer then grabs you and chains you up to a radiator? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Again, I think word will get around. <laughs> um, I mean, it is interesting that actually, you know, what, you know, in reality, what are the main cases where a worker gets chained up to a radiator, radiator right now in the United States? You usually, who are people who get chained to radiators? We have workers who get chained to radiators normally. Again, if you saw the, uh, the movie Black Snake Moan, you will have a counterexample for me. But <laughs> you know, you know, when, when you read in the newspaper that a worker was chained to a radiator, who, how do you, what, what, is that person, what is that person's legal status normally? Illegal. Normally, they're an illegal immigrant. And normally, they're a particular kind of illegal immigrant. They're an illegal immigrant that was smuggled in for $10,000, and they didn't have $10,000. So they're basically working off their debt, and the employer is chaining them up because they think that once you, that I pay $10,000 for you, once you're here, you're not going to work off your debt. You're just going to run away. Okay, so uh, this is, in fact, a case where, if you, strangely enough, you know, if these enforcement techniques were not available, it might actually be harder to get here illegally which, of course, is what most people would want. But if you listen to Ben Powell last night, you may wonder, oh, well, on the one hand, they're chained up to a radiator. On, on the other hand, it's much better to be chained to that radiator than to be stuck in Haiti. If you think that's crazy, go to Haiti and see. Uh, it's, uh, it's no, yeah. there, there's no comparison. Uh, yeah, yes? Um, in Colorado, we recently had a lawsuit where a group of citizens sued the state for violating some taxpayers' bill of rights. 
Uh huh. So where does that fit in mm. here? I know. Let's see. Right. I mean, I predict they will lose. <laughs> in fact, I bet they will. I, I will. We can. I mean, I like to bet people on things publicly as long as I can blog it. It gives me something to talk about. Uh, yes. Uh, they. They. Well, well. All right. Well. I'm, good thing I didn't bet you then. So. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, mm. When, what did the lawsuit rule? So, what, what was the ruling? I mean, the state's appealing it, but basically they said ah. that the state can ask for a mill levy increase before, mm -hmm. you know, under the taxpayer control, uh -huh. they say that that's too bad. Ah. And so the judge ruled that the state was wrong, and now mm. they're appealing. So I'm mm. just wondering who handles disputes between private citizens and the state? Mm. Well, let's see, who handles them right now is the state. Yes. Um, I mean, this is the case where I think any, you know, any, any, any you know, person with common sense would say, hmm, there's something a little odd about that. Uh, you know, you know, that's kind of like having your brother-in-law do the arbitration, <laughs> except you didn't have the choice of saying, I don't want it to be your brother-in-law. You know, the state says, look, I am, you know, who else could possibly do it? Uh, you know, it, is quite, you know, it is certainly conceivable that the state could actually you know, write a taxpayer's bill of rights and put in a clause saying, disputes about this will be resolved in private arbitration with the following agency. Uh, that would, you know, of course, make it much more credible. Uh, that, you know, that could certainly be done. Okay. So let's see. So the, you know, think, think about other things that are, are too extreme where you start worrying, like, you know, the, you know, a lot of things could be privatized, but not this. Oh, let's see, how about a question from you? Um, I know it involves children, which is complicated. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. How would uh, crimes mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep, that, that's absolutely is a problem. Uh, the, you know, the, the obvious choices are other relatives. Okay, so if grandparents care about the kids or aunts or uncles care about the kids, they, I mean, they're, they're, of course, the people who are most likely to be bringing the state's attention here. So that would be a natural case. Again, this is, of course, another case where you probably don't have a contract with your father saying, if I turn out to be a bad parent, you get the kid. So, uh, you know, so again, as long as public courts are still involved, this would be a case where the public court would say this is a custody dispute. Uh, and what's going to happen is that you guys are going to, uh, you are going to have to go and get, get somebody in arbitration order to handle this. Right. And again, part of the arbitration would be, uh, so you, know, you are going to have to pay compensation for the harm that you've done to the child. Okay. So now again, again you know, so when you start talking about someone who is an extremely violent criminal, this is where simply signing a contract for restitution uh, may seem inadequate. Although again, if you have the threat of we will put you in jail if you don't pay up, that is a much more that is actually still a pretty serious threat. And again, it's one that government could keep that threat to put people in jail without actually being involved any further in the process of punishment. Yes. Well, Mm -hmm. state, who's going to make the rules about how you tax people? Mm -hmm. Say you don't pay your taxes, mm -hmm. you go to this court, mm -hmm. they uh, send you to uh, arbitration, mm -hmm. but then is everybody going to have their own tax code based mm -hmm. on arbitration, or is it going to be an objective code? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this, is, this is, of course, getting close to the next topic, which is uh, once you have an idea of what the revised minimum state is, so once you have appropriately adjusted how small government could conceivably be, Right? And it's pretty small, right? Yeah. So I mean, if you were just imagine a government of the kind that I'm talking about, this is a government where they have an army to make sure that police agencies don't start killing each other. They have courts where you show up and they say, "Go to the arbitration room." <laughs> they, you know, you know, you, you know, they, they have, you know, in the arbitration room, the arbitrator says, "If you don't, if you don't go, if you don't go along by what we sign, then you will go to jail." Right. This is a very small government we're talking about now. It's, it's, it's. You know, this makes the night watchman state look enormous. Okay, but here's the thing. Once you're already there, then there's the question. Do we really need this last part? Right? You know, just think about this last case where we say, look, we're going to keep an army to make sure that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the other police agencies don't attack each other or otherwise abuse their power. Okay, that sounds good, but then there is an obvious difficulty with this. Say, look, we need to have the big fish to make sure the medium fish doesn't pick on the little fish. And that's the solution. There is something weird about that. Yes. See, and who protects us from the big fish? The, the, yes. The, <laughs> who protects us from the biggest fish? <laughs> yes. The, the, the food protects us from the fish bigger than which no fish can be conceived. <laughs> and we call and this and this we call government. And so QED, government it must exist. No. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. So, I mean, once you are at that position, it does start to be a little bit strange to say that this is the solution. To say, well, gee, what it, what is an obvious question that might occur to you when you say the solution to our troubles is to have one police agency bigger than all the others that can make sure that everybody does the right thing? What is the concern there? 
Again, not knowing anything else about the world, but what sounds funny about that story? Yeah, you know, who protects us from erectors? Who guards the guardians? And so, it's the case of, yeah, well, if we are willing to have a system where we, where we put our trust in one big fish and just hope that he's not going to do anything to, to anybody else, then you may say, yeah, well, why don't we just pull the plug on this big fish, say that, you have that uh, if you want to get some money, you've got to raise it by, getting, by, by, by actually having willing customers pay for your services and you're no different from anybody else. You may say, well, what happens if, say, if, uh, if the big fish then goes and abuses power? Well, what happens if the big fish abuses power now? Although right now the big fish has a number of advantages. Uh, you know, well, you know, what, you know, what right now is, you know, makes life more convenient for a government that wants to do something bad than, say, for a security guard company? Suppose you know, you're running a security guard company and you say, look, tonight we strike. Tonight we are going to attack our enemies. We're going to wipe them out in a single night, then we'll have a monopoly. What concerns might occur to you right now if you were proposing this plan? Yes. I, I, could you speak up very loud because you're almost impossible to hear over there? Really loud. Really loud. I, I, still, I still can't hear. You know, can you, can you, can you like stand up, come, come close to the room, and then shout? Yeah. What's that? You might lose customers. Lose customers. Well, I mean, I mean, their plan is, look, there will be the only game in town tomorrow when all our enemies are dead. <laughs> right, so you know, someone says, what about the customers? Well, we'll be the only game in town. We're not worried about the customers. Uh, but what are, what, are, what are some, you know, I don't, I don't know that, that one. You know, what, what are some other fears you might have in making this plan? There's a lot of other people. Yes, there's a lot of other people. So they might, they, you, know, you might lose. <laughs> Quite likely might lose. And then here's another thing. You, you go to your security guards and they, you know, they look around the room and they're a bunch of middle-aged guys in their 50s. And you say, you know, you know, you know, anyway, you know, guys in their 50s. And, and, you, and you say, all right, tonight we strike. We're going to attack all enemies and wipe them out. Uh, what do you think that your, that your employees might say to this plan? No. Say, no. <laughs> uh, I don't want to risk my life in order to, on some crazy scheme in order to gain a monopoly. You know, or they might say, sure, if you raise my salary to a million dollars a year, then I consider it. Say, well, but all my calculations about the money I was going to make were based on the assumption I could continue to pay you minimum wage. Well, in that case, it's not going to work. On the other hand, when a government wants to do something like this, has a number of advantages, and probably this was best expressed by Napoleon. There's a story about how Napoleon, you know, someone, you know, Napoleon was once standing on a hill, and down in the valley there were a whole bunch of French soldiers desperately trying to recover a cannon in the middle of a battle and push it back up a hill. And you know, the soldiers were dying by the dozens trying to retrieve this cannon, and one of Napoleon's advisors said, but a hundred men are going to be lost in order to recover one cannon. And then Napoleon says, yes, but cannons cost me a lot of money, and soldiers I get for free. So, uh, you know, in the case where you actually have to pay soldiers for risky actions, uh, then it uh, does become harder to recruit again. So right now we have a volunteer army, and with the result, of, one of the results of the war in Iraq is it's been gotten harder to get volunteers. People who are willing to sign up to be bossed around for, uh, without, without being shot at for a few years often are not willing to sign up to be bossed around and shot at. Okay, so you know, once, once you have actually got down to, the, to this very small state, like uh, John Haas's in Remedial State, where you keep the government in order to make sure that no police agency get, uh, gets into trouble, this does make you wonder, gee, if I'm willing to trust one big police agency that survives through taxation and, might be, and could actually conscript soldiers in order to fight for it, why am I unwilling to trust a bunch of agencies that can't do this?